Shabbat Shalom uh, to everyone and uh, who has joined us here while we're going through all the messages and the song and the prayer and things like that. Thank you uh, for being patient. And for those joining us on video, uh, we, um, we welcome you too. And just to know that you're welcome to come join us live if you like. Uh, we gather live on the Zoom gathering uh, at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, on Shabbats. So um, that is uh, the Saturday in the Pacific Northwest, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So wherever you are in the world, whatever time that may be, um, if you're able and you want to come and join us, you are very welcome. And uh, all you need to do to do that is get the link to come and join us, which we send out every week uh, through our newsletter. And so just to get that newsletter, you just go to uh, rivershabbat.com, just scroll down, click the newsletter, the subscribe, and you just give us your email, first name and last name, and then you're on the uh, subscriber list. You'll get the weekly link with the upcoming um, River Shabbat gathering and related teaching or testimony, uh, as well as other uh, things from time to time, which we announce uh, as a part of uh, the community newsletter. So uh, you're very welcome to come and join us. We look forward to having you. All right. Every knee shall bow, fear and trembling. We are continuing a bit of a journey here. We're looking at the book of Philippians. Who was here? Uh, hands up for part one. So we did that and we did the bonds of Messiah. And uh, we should have a bit of an understanding about the context of this book. If you've not seen, we'll have that posted shortly. Um, but if you've not seen the, do not understand the context of the book of Philippians, its themes, um, what Paul was being used, how that was working as a part of uh, his second and third journeys, uh, and things like that, and his famed uh, sort of journeys of the Apostle Paul. Um, but in that, we're giving a context to as to the bondservant reality of what Paul was being called to, but also um, how that was interfacing with, um, you know, this uh, neat sort of Roman outpost uh, in Philippi. And uh, so in that, we sort of looked at those sorts of things. Now, as a part of understanding what is a biblical way to understand what a bond servant is, not the Roman or Egyptian view of a slave, um, and, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, just any form of slavery. It's not how our father looks at it. And in fact, the way it was understood by Paul and the way he was relating it, that it was an honor to be a bondservant of the Most High. So we need to know what that is, because is that based um, the way we traditionally think of in the sense of servitude um, or much English translations around slavery, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, when we get a proper biblical understanding from a Hebraic sense and that culture and where it was, we see that a bond servant has a very different reality from a modern Western type of slavery type thinking. Uh, and indeed one that even uh, Elohim himself would walk in an example for us to understand uh, in the ultimate um, uh, pattern and example of servitude uh, in, for his creation. And so when we understand how this all works, we understand that we have a CEO that wasn't asking us to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. And as some of you have heard me say in the past, we have the ultimate CEO with a mop in his hand while the workers come through the door. This is who we have as an Elohim. And you should be very grateful for that. This is not some capricious God of some religious dogma. We have something, we have a faith that is not only so far astounding in all of its aspects, a God that is so incredible in every aspect of how he is doing his plan of redemption and a love so great we'll spend eternity understanding it. And so these are things that we have as a part of the faith and nothing else on earth comes close if we will understand it. Now, if we get our religious dogma, that's what we talk about at River Shabbat a lot. You know how we, I talk about the Christian side of the river. And I talk about, you know, the Judeo side of the river and Hebrew roots, Messianic movements. Generally, when I'm speaking in context, and then we talk about the river and why we come and gather as a, as a community, as a family, and we call it the river. And the reason isn't because we're not for our Christian brothers and sisters or for our Hebrew root and Messianic brothers and sisters, you know, or Judah, Judeo brothers and sisters. 
what we're doing here is we're saying that there is incredible truths on both sides of the river of life. And indeed, River Shabbat is based off the great prophecies contained in Daniel for the time of the end. Um, this prophecy of the river and the, that, the one who would hover above it and that we would have this river of living waters and these two on each sides of the bank trying to understand how this is all going to work. And for us to come out of mystery Babylon and into this beautiful mikvah of the faith, the living waters. And we tend to get caught up in the what's and not the why of what's going on. And, and although the what's are the Tudor picture for us to get the why of this all, and they're important. If we do the Tudor and don't understand why we're doing the Tudor, we've kind of missed. And if we make up what the why is and don't understand that the Tudor is teaching us how to view the why, then we can end up with fables and things like that. And so what we have found on both sides of the river of life is there is truth, some real serious truths on the Judeo-Hebrew root messianic side, and there's some very serious truths on the Christian side. However, the waters are muddied on both. Our Messiah was facing that 2,000 years ago in the flesh with the muddied waters and reality of an apostate corrupted Judeo system, even though they were worshiping the true Elohim and certainly uh, understood the foundation of the faith as being, uh, including the front of the book, the Torah, but they had become corrupted by Mr. Babylon. And 2,000 years later, on the other side now, we're corrupted in the opposite direction, no longer standing on the rock and the faith and 30,000 bits of sand and denominations and movements and religious dogma. And we wonder why a lot of people's faith crumbles or can't stand. Just exactly as scripture said, you know, we build our house on the rock, uh, on the sand or the rock. So we're in this situation now where as a community, we are being honest uh, as best we can on the journey to say, you know what? I don't want to throw away, you know, as they say, the baby with the bathwater. We're not going to throw away the truth that sits on either side of this river, but we do need to come out of mystery Babylon that also exists on both sides. And there are spiritual untruths and deceptions that sit there. And, you know, to sit on the Christian side and think that you have it and you're one of 30,000 plus denominations is actually a delusion. And to sit there in many of these Hebrew roots, Messianic and Judeo sides thinking, oh, well, I'm on the other side now, so I've got it all, is also a delusion. What we're actually called to is a place of teshuva, repentance, where we are to come out of mystery Babylon and we're going to allow the Ruach to to teach us with all spirit and truth and love. And so this is the journey we are on. And this is the journey that Paul had to live. He was living it from the Judeo side. Many of us have having to live it coming off the Christian side. So this is where, when he's going through the bond and setting up and understanding what he was doing, going to this Roman outpost at, at Philippi, and understanding the whole reality of a bond servant and what this really meant, we see that there's an essence of once he establishes that, then there's a way now to view our journey, our walk. He's teaching them something. And I've got here, every knee shall bow. Um, fear and trembling is part two or chapter two as we go through this series. And even though we're basing it off going through uh, the, the book of Philippians, which is a very little read or understood book, to be honest, in the Brit Hadashar, the New Testament, um, by both sides of the, the river. That might be the, the, the foundation of what we're talking about. But, but what we're really talking about is the essence of a man who understood the faith at levels that many of us are trying to get to or to understand. And uh, Paul understood things at levels that... Um, that are exceptional. And that is why he was used to arguably do 14 of the epistles in what we call the, the New Testament. So as we go through and, and look at these things, my encouragement is this, that sometimes we just got to set the noise aside and actually just look at what was the context 2000 years ago in the Hebrew culture in Hebraic faith being raised in Torah. They don't have a New Testament. The word to them is what we call the prophets in the Old Testament. So what is the context of what Paul is dealing with as you've got 
a bondage occurring on the house of Israel being administered from Rome. And he's now going to a Roman outpost. And indeed, Paul himself had a Roman citizenship, you know, in the, in the shadow picture. And so he was able to travel and go and do things that others may not have um, out of Jerusalem. So he was used in a certain way, but he also had exceptional knowledge of the faith. You know, this man could have quoted you verbatim, you know, the book of Deuteronomy. He understood the faith technically at levels that we didn't, and yet he had missed the revelation of it. And so this is why I say to people, if you think you can do this on knowledge alone, you don't know your Bible. You don't know what you're reading. If you think that you can do this as a knowledge quest. Now, indeed, we want his knowledge. We want his truth, of course. And we, we as a result of being in Teshuvah, we will become more knowledgeable. But if the pursuit is not Messiah, and the, if the pursuit is actually information and knowledge, we can end up very corrupted. And so many of us, anybody relate to that? Has anybody gone down running down knowledge journeys and rabbit holes and all sorts of things? And you've kind of been circling back and the Ruach's kind of, you know, leading you to another place. I want to see hands up who has actually been through that. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few hands here. Um, and so this is what happens because we, we want to, um, we hunger and thirst for truth. So I'm not, it's not, a, it's not attacking or belittling anybody for going down that journey. The Father knows. He wants us to hunger and thirst for truth. But, but, but the enemy does too. The adversary does too. So what he's doing is he's steering us into Mystery Babylon to do it. And then we end up running down these rabbit holes. And that's the point. So it's not the hungry and thirsting that's the issue. It certainly wasn't with me. It was always legit. I'm sure it was with many of you. But we find ourselves, did anybody find themselves in a bit of an unhealthy place as a result? Be honest. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And if you're honest with that position, you're in teshuva. Because you can't say that and be honest with that level of awareness unless the Father's opening your eyes to it. This is a bit of the fear and trembling aspect. If we can't do this to a holy Elohim, if we can't get what chapter two is about before the creator of all things and a holiness at a level and an understanding that is way beyond our pay grade, if we can't do it to this, our pride will destroy us from garment preparation. We should be able to gather here and understand how, not only how fall, fall, far uh, um, we fall or how short we fall, how short uh, we, um, uh, we have fallen in, in the sense of truly a set apart Elohim. If we can't gather and have that discussion without pride, without justification, without all of this stuff, before a holy Elohim, we're in real trouble. Now, I know we can struggle with each other on that front, okay? Because you're dealing with a brother or sister, you're not before a holy Elohim. And then suddenly everybody's pride comes up, doesn't it? Has anybody ever, ever found your pride sneaked up on you in a conversation or a discussion with a brother or sister? And, and it did with them too? And now suddenly you've got pride coming against pride and you've got these two fallen menstrual cloths having an argument about holiness. <laughs> I want you to give the picture of what Elohim sees. He sees two menstrual cloths having an argument about something that's far above their pay grade. And you wonder why the angelic host has no problem fulfilling the execution orders of Elohim when it's necessary, because they are looking at something that is exceptionally ugly. Sobering, isn't it, as to what we really look like? Now, the good news is, and fathers and mothers, you'll know this, your children at a, at a young age looked really terrible to you at times. It might have been covered in mud and misbehaving. And that, but there was a part of you as a parent that had a love that rose above those moments, didn't it? 
You see, now we start to understand the love of a father, love of a mother in the essence of what this is, because believe me, it's going to take that because your kids would have been dead long ago at the age of five if you didn't have that love. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> and you know it, mom and dad, you know it. It took a love that was greater than what the scene looked like. Is that fair? No. Now, we need to remember that. That image you got in front of you there, every knee shall bow, it means it. And we're about to read something that Paul's talking about, about you know, this whole fear and trembling aspect. What does that mean? What does it mean in proper context? What does this all really mean? We have the faith, so great, so beautiful, so powerful in every aspect. No one else has it on earth. Yet, we must contend with what Paul was able to say to them. You will do this knowing that this is Elohim. So brain, right? I can see a few of you nodding your heads there. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm going to shake you because you, you think you're really good. You're really loved, but you're not really good. In fact, your Messiah said, no, not one. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. So we don't impress him, but what we try to do is impress each other, don't we? How honest do we want to get today? Why don't, I, why don't I just water this down right now? We can all feel good. We can go about our day and all feel good about ourselves. You all look wonderful. You're all so pleasing to Elohim and you do everything perfect. Can I hit your ears? How about we hit your ears for the next hour? You want me to do that? It's happening all over the place. Here's the thing. Just because I don't itch your ears doesn't mean you won't receive love and joy and be encouraged either. This is a very encouraging message. Hopefully by the end of this, you'll agree. But, but we need to be in a place where it's not itching ears we're after. It's his spirit and truth and love. And that brings a joy that Paul talks about that actually surpasses all understanding, a joy that will actually occur regardless of the circumstances we face. If we will grow into that space. Well, what does it take to go into that space? It takes the spirit, it takes its truth, and it takes each other, apparently. You mean we all need each other to get there? Yep. We're going to need discipleship in this too. Oh, we patterned it. You mean we're going to actually need to learn how to walk together. And as Messiah matures and grows in us, we're going to help each other get there. It's amazing how it works. If we'll believe. And if we will bow a knee, we're going to learn to bow a knee today. Not in a religious tradition. Okay. Not because it's something good to do or it looks good. We might be able to bow a knee physically, but can we do it spiritually? Okay, so this is the outline as we go through this. And again, we're using the foundation of these four teachings. We're using the book of Philippians, but in such, it's way bigger than that, of course. Bonds and Messiah, we're looking at Evanisha Bell. We're going to look at heavenly passport next week, and then we're going to look at casting crowns. Is anybody here getting a sense that the book of Philippians might be a little bit more for us than we first thought or thought before? I'm trying to give you a sense that this book is more because a lot of people skip it or don't really know or remember a few little bits in it. But if you get what Paul was dealing with, with the Roman outpost of Philippi, he's giving some exceptional things for us to understand and to think about. And it's why this particular early call thrived. They actually listened. They heard and they thrived as a result. Is everyone getting that? 
Do you want to be a part of the call that thrives or do you want to be in Corinth where he's constantly having to deal with a whole bunch of stuff? Because Philippi, they were infected by some serious stuff spiritually, but they did listen and they did value what was going on. We want to be those people, even though we're spiritually adulterated. We've all been infected here. They had certainly as well. We spoke a little bit about that last session. If you haven't seen last session, like I say, I'll be trying to get it up this week a lot as long with this one uh, as well. Okay. I got a quote here by uh, Einstein. You all know who he is. Um, or you should, or I think you do. Um, anyway, he says here, unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Now, who here thinks that Albert Einstein is against authority by making that statement? He's also made other quotes. I can tell you he's not. So what's going on? We're witnessing this play out on the earth right now, by the way. There's no discernment going on as to the corrupt and evil authority that's actually governing Rome right now. And we're all being affected as a result. They're actually just listening to this complete ignorance and blindness. Sheep to the slaughter. That's actually what he's talking about. He's not talking about you don't respect authority. What he's saying is, is unthinking, no critical thought as to what you're witnessing. Interesting. Do you think you have an Elohim here that said, you know, you know what? I don't want you to know about me. I don't want you to try and you know, do anything about me. You just respect me, the capricious God, which you cannot know. Is that our faith? No. What if I told you that the King of Kings actually would agree with this statement by Einstein? In fact, what if I told you the King of Kings said, ask and you shall receive? Test all things. Seek and you shall find. Wait a minute. You mean we have an Elohim that's saying, yeah, come and know your Elohim. You mean we've got parents spiritually that are going, yes, son, yes, daughter. I wouldn't mind you knowing me at a level. When you start to grow up, you're going to start to know who your mom and dad is. Has any parents here enjoyed the adult relationship with their children because they got to actually know you. And then you started to discover and have a relationship with your own physical children, blood, at a different level that had nothing to do in the end with blood. You actually started to learn to love and enjoy them and them you. It wasn't just the raising them child state. So the one that you were wiping their bottoms is now the one you're actually listening to, hearing their views on something, the discussion maybe even giving you advice. Maybe you're even seeking the advice, mom and dad, of the one of the bottom you wiped once. How does this work? Did you, did you want your children to stay one years old forever? I know moms, they're all cute and precious, blah, 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 right? Okay, all right. You know, I know. There's the, that's why you have to have moms because... <laughs> men aren't so good with the one-year-olds <laughs> and if they are they're kind of pretending and they might enjoy it for a while but they're nowhere near the moms moms actually make sure that children survive to about three or four <laughs> you know the, 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 men, the men are really struggling on a lot of fronts there. generally speaking i'm generalizing I know. but but really you need a mother's design particularly in those real real nursing years i mean the, the physical shadow picture of that is a man doesn't do too well on the whole breast milk thing does he <laughs> okay there is a reason why mom is very necessary there's okay the ruach is doing something in our spiritual journey at stages that is very necessary but there is a point where we are to grow when the, when the Ruach leads us unto all truth, when we are to grow to a certain place where our sovereignty is going to start to make a play, whether we're going to bow our knee or not. And parents, your children had to go through this too, where you as a parent suddenly started to go, I'm sorry, I don't accept that behavior anymore, son or daughter. You did only the year before, but now you don't. Why? 
you're actually raising the level of sovereignty and the interaction, responsibility, accountability, and consequence, which is the design pattern of the father for a creation was starting to occur. And if you didn't do that, you didn't do it to your folly. And now they're probably teenagers that don't have, they have no direction or compass in their lives. And you're wondering, you know, how it is that, you know, this happened. Well, wonder no more. Did they get responsibility, accountability, and consequence at the time that they should have? It doesn't mean your love was any less just because you didn't allow a certain behavior anymore. Is it possible that that whole model could be teaching us something spiritually? Just saying. Is it possible that he set up a whole creation for us to get how this works? And that some of us are now arriving at a place where Father Elohim is going, uh, sorry, son, sorry, daughter, that's not acceptable anymore. You actually do know better. Is anybody experiencing that in your walk, in your faith, that you're actually starting to sense the Father's going, no, no, you know better. There's actually going to be consequence now. see a number of hands. Interesting, eh? It's all in front of us. Why am I pointing out to this way? Am I belittling you? No, not at all. I'm helping us to think of something a certain way. Why? Because that is what I'm tasked to do. That's what I'm designed to do. I'm not going to make an apology for that. I'm designed to actually raise this a certain way so that we will understand and get it. Because what we're talking about right now is some of the weightiest matters you will ever understand in scripture. Oh, you thought the weightier matters was trying to understand the Nephilim. <laughs> you know, or something like that. Oh, no. These are the real things that matter because we're reaching a stage in our spiritual journey where the father is going, no. Your sovereignty is now going to play a role in your growth, your garment preparation, those who will prepare. And so now I'm tasked to, to, to use the very shadow picture he gave us to remind us all. I remind you, I bring to memory, I do these sorts of things. I'll do it in a certain way. I'm designed to and tasked to. All he's saying here is that Nowhere in the world are we to throw our brain away when it comes to understanding authority. And you have an Elohim that has also said that. I want you to know who I am. So you get this. You don't get to make it up. You don't get to make up your authority in your life. Kids, daughter, son, you don't get to make me up who your mom and dad is. You let me teach you who your mom and dad is. You don't get to make this up. Make sense? I'm going to ask again until I see a, a nod here. I've only got some of the make sense. Okay. Test all things. Do not quench the spirit. Notice the order this comes in. You quench the spirit, which is your helper to discern things. You're done. So can we do this now? Can we test all things without the Ruach? No, you're going to see how this lines up. Do not despise prophecies. Ooh, that means don't despise somebody who tells you uh, the future in two weeks, right? Isn't that what you learned? It's got nothing to do with it. The actual word there, the, uh, uh, the prophetia in Greek, um, is actually discord emanating from divine inspiration. Declaration, the purpose of Elohim, whether reproving or admonishing the wicked, comforting the afflicted even, revealing of the hidden things. Interesting. You mean this is discernment? Who here learned on your Christian side of the walk that understanding prophecy was about, about discerning truth? Wasn't prophecy just about future freaky stuff? It's not what it is. Now, can it include matters of the uh, 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 things that are hidden? Yeah, it's the glory of Elohim to concealed matter and the honor of kings to search out of course there are things for us to discover the pearls a great price all these sorts of things but we like hasatan always does he takes one thing and says, oh i have a i have a prophetic ministry really i see those kind of claims all the time in, in the christian side for instance and i sit there and I go wow i really want to hear that man this person must discern and rightly 
you know, discern the word of Elohim at levels I've never seen before. And then you go and watch what the prophetic ministry is. And it's a bunch of people playing Harry Potter, modern day soothsayers over people they don't even know from getting it from someone they don't know. And somehow this is a prophetic ministry. It's wicked. At its worst, it's childish at its best. What it is not is scriptural. What it is not is truth. What it is not is Elohim. And I don't mean to offend anybody on this, but I can't stress this enough. Come out of her, my people. I just used a Christian example. Don't worry, I'll get to the Hebrew, it's messianic side soon enough here in this teaching. No one comes away unscathed. We're all needing to enter into teshuva. Me, first and foremost, who's sharing this. Test everything and hold fast to what is good. This is interesting. And abstain from every form of evil. Remember, we talked in the first part of this. Or sorry, the end of Ecclesiastes. We're all participating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And is it possible that the more we become sanctified, the more we grow, the more we're in repentance, we're going to start to be able to stay. And, 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 and even though we're trapped in this time domain, that we can be um, enjoying the fruit, the good fruit. Now, eternally righteous fruit will come after our resurrection. There is lots of good fruit in Rome. And there's lots of evil fruit. And right now, they are really, they're harvesting evil from this thing right now. But the instruction that we had is, is that we can test these things and therefore our lives can bear good fruit. And Elohim is not good or evil. He created good and evil. He's not subject to his creation. And so what are we looking at? What there isn't in this, the spirit, we discern the word, then as, because we discern, now we can understand what is good, and then it allows us to say no to what is not. Do you see how that works? Just boom, 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 boom. Right there in that order. There you go. No, what there isn't is any room for rebellion. There's no room for rebellion. Rebellion starts here, by the way. Do not quench the spirit. And I'm seeing this in religious dogma on both sides of the riverbank. No spirit. I don't see the Ruach on either side in some of these teachings, ministries, whatever. Sometimes I don't see the truth on either side. Doesn't mean I don't see the intent for them. But it doesn't mean it's actually there. If we quench the spirit, you can listen to all truth. And if the spirit is quenched on that, it is dead according to scripture. It's dead words on a page, but you got really knowledgeable. No life, and it will bring death. No good fruit will come out of it. Is it possible that when he says, I desire you to worship me in spirit and truth, he actually means that? <laughs> spirit, truth equals good and will allow you to abstain from evil. If rebellion's here, you won't do any of that journey. I know better. I want to play in Mystery Babylon. The themes of Philippians, the bond sermon, the good news of Messiah. This is what Paul's doing. Walk with humility and reverence of Elohim. Joy is in Messiah, not our circumstances. Hope, not in this world, but in what is to come. And it all coming back to our ambassadorship, our witness, our light to a dying world. This is what he's doing, and he's doing this to a people that are going to listen, even though they are spiritually disadvantaged, I will, I'll say. They've got a lot of rubbish hanging around this area, especially the hangovers from the Greek cultures. A lot of temptation. So the Hebrew journey, saved, enslaved, delivered. What's the delivered bit about? We know that his blood has purchased us. We know we've been, we're currently enslaved in the time domain. Unless, of course, you think, you know, I'll speak for North America, but in North America, unless you think that Biden and Trudeau represent all freedom. 
<laughs> in New Zealand, it would be Jacinda Ardern. I know the believers in New Zealand go, she represents freedom, not slavery. The whole thing should be very evident to us now. We are slaves. It's just, they, they, they don't even fear it anymore. They're just, it's just coming out. And in fact, people want their slavery because it keeps them safe. I want to be enslaved because I'm safe. I want to be the bear in the cage, remember? A safe bear, you know, a, 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 an enslaved bear is a safe bear. We are the proverbial society that says we want to be a zoo. We are. We're the society that's convinced that if we could line up animals and give them a choice of a wilderness or a cage, we are a society that is convinced the animal would choose the cage. It's hideous. We are partaking from the tree of evil, right? Okay, who's got their Bibles? All right. Let us open to chapter two. And we're just going to read this incredible little chapter. And we're going to have a discussion, some fellowship on that. All right. All right. He says, if then there is any encouragement in Messiah, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and compassion, May my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love in one being and purpose. Boy, that's body language. Doing none at all through selfishness or self-conceit, but with humility, consider others better than yourselves. Wow. Do you believe that Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, actually got to the point where he considered those he was serving were better than he was. And in that sense, is it better in the sense of we, when we think better, we think, you know, oh, someone's better. Now he's not, he's creating the very thing he's telling you not to create if that's how you believe it. What he's saying is that if everyone's position is that, we are on equal footing of humility. Do you see the point? But if one elevates themselves above everyone else, there's a hierarchy. And the only one that's, that's allowed to be in that seat right now is Yeshua. Yeah. So do you see what he's saying? If we all view it this way, we have unity through humility. There's no Nicolaitan reality here. There's no lording. Now we've got a chance to have even greater respect for those who are serving because you're not now respecting them because it's a hierarchy. You're actually giving respect to those who are giving their lives to serve you, which is what Paul would say. It's not good for you if you're going to continue to treat me like this. He wasn't saying, respect my authority. In fact, that was so far beyond what he would teach, it's not even funny. What he was saying is this will not be good for you because if you actually get this, the Messiah is speaking through me right now. And it's not based on hierarchy. It's based on his presence. Wow. It's actually Nicolaitism that eliminates the need for the Ruach. Because you don't need it now. I've got the hierarchy. I'll just drop the kids off at Sunday school. I'll, just, I'll leave it to the pastor. Pastor, you sort my marriage out. Sunday school teacher, you, you raise my children in their ways. In his ways. Wow. If we actually get what he's just said there, he has not said, don't respect what Messiah has asked me to do. In fact, that would be to your folly. But don't raise me as having more worth than you. And if the person beside you doesn't do that, you're now both walking humbly. That's the point. Do not consider yourselves in that space. Each one should look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. So if we're in that space, now we're going to be able to understand that, whatever that is in, 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 in someone else's life. 
to each one should, um, uh, sorry, for let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped, <laughs> but emptied himself. Look at this, taking the form of a servant and came to be in the likeness of men. Do you know what he's just told you? Elohim's inserted himself into the flesh and come into the time domain. And we know what he's actually reminding us of? If Elohim can do that from his position, we can certainly do it from ours. <laughs> okay, because we, we, we have a much shorter journey to that place than he did. <laughs> There's no excuse for us. And having been found in fashion, fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Death even of the stake. Elohim, therefore, has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above all names. And, of course, here's what we're going to be digging a little bit into today. That the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow. And those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. Whoa, now we've got some interdimensional speak going on here. I'm going to suggest to you that all of creation this is relating to. Everything will bow to the one who has all authority. And every tongue shall confess that Yeshua Messiah is master to the esteem of Elohim or Father Creator. So that my beloved, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence, so in other words, not only when I was kicking around, but now much rather in my absence. Look at this. Work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling. Why would you say that? You mean there's a participation happening from our perspective? You mean, we, 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 <laughs> you mean there's something that we, he wants us to do as a part of this relationship? Interesting. So we're going to look at what that actually means. Do you think that's worth understanding what Paul just said there? Is that fair? He's just said some pretty big things, hasn't he? Yeah. It takes big. He's actually telling them, we're going to see every knee bow, all authority. It's totally interdimensional. And by the way, you've got some ownership in this. So if that's not interesting to people who claim to be of the faith, <laughs> it's, you, know, you might as well just check out now. For if Elohim is working in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure, do all matters without grumbling and disputing. Well, that describes the body, doesn't it? <laughs> that's what we've lived our whole lives in the faith, isn't it? And that's what everyone's witnessed. Everybody's witnessed this and everybody has done this themselves. We've all done all matters without grumbling and disputing. Wow, eh? <laughs> okay, so we can all accept maybe we need to think about what Paul's trying to get at here, right? Unless, of course, you're quite happy with saying, yeah, my life's been all about no grumbling and no disputing within the body of Messiah. <laughs> if you can say that, well, then you don't need to be here for the rest. Just shut it off. Go somewhere else, pat yourself on the back, look at yourself in the mirror for a while. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Love yourself. Stare at yourself for ages. Because you're there. Why you're alive still, I don't know. But nonetheless, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not right. That's not nice. I apologize. I do apologize, honestly, for that. But I mean it still. Okay. So <laughs> just so everyone knows. All right. Like, you know, just remember, I'm saying it to me too, right? Okay. In order that you may be blameless and faultless children of Elohim, without blemish, in the midst of of a crooked and perverse generation. Okay. Now, none of us are around or experiencing a crooked and perverse generation, right? So we don't need to worry about this. I'd say it's very, very applicable to today, even 2,000 years later. 
among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hmm, nothing new under the sun. So crooked and perverse generation then, crooked and perverse generation now. Manifests a little differently, but it's still about us being a light amongst this dying world. Holding on, look at this, to the word of life. Wow. For a boast to me in the day of Messiah that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Do you know what he's actually stating there? This is the rewards judgment seat of Messiah. He's directly referencing here. By the way, he's directly referencing Yom Teruah, the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. He knows it. It's coming. He's going to be resurrected out of all of this. And he's actually now referring to it. And some will lose reward on that day. Paul's at a point in his life where he's starting to go, you know what? If you can get this, you will be what is attributed to me as a part of my reward. And if you get this and others and you work together with them, they will contribute to you as a part of this day. You mean that if we stop grumbling and disputing and start getting on with the business of loving and helping one another, that there's actually a direct link to our Bema seat and judgment seat of Messiah? Now, look at how we've been, been behaving as a body, so-called body of believers on both sides. Do you, think that, do you think any of us have been investing in some hay and stubble for that day? This should be sobering. We're destroying our own rewards. I sometimes make a statement. Anybody's known my teachings over the years. You'll hear me say that I'm in the business of trying to destroy my rewards every day. And Elohim's in the business of trying to preserve it. <laughs> and it all involves his sovereignty and my sovereignty. I have a father that's doing everything he can. He wants to reward us on that day. We're going to talk about this next week. He wants to. But my fallen state is doing everything possible to make that a very difficult thing right now. And he's honoring love and sovereignty. Now, this is interesting, right? So it's like, okay, <laughs> let's work this out. Who's the real enemy here? Don't I get to blame the devil? Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just show up at the beam of Satan and say, that is that devil, that wily devil. He made me do it. No responsibility, accountability, or consequence. Give me, lavish me with those rewards, Messiah, because I've lived such a life that deserves everything you have and everything you can give me because I'm so great. And by the way, you need to sit down and listen to my knowledge. I need to tell you some things, Elohim. I need to tell you some things I've learned in my religion. Should I stop? Should we get back to ear itching? In fact, even if I'm being picking up in verse 17 here, chapter two, in fact, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the offering of service of your belief. Drink offering. He's referring direct now to the libation, the actual drink offering, a portion of the wine that would be poured on the sacrificial meat. He's referring directly to Torah here and a certain principle. And he's saying, even if I'm being poured out, just like Messiah's blood was poured out for us, it's a libation of service, of labor. Do you see what's happening here? He's saying, even if I am poured out a drink offering on the offering and the service of your belief, your belief now, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Isn't that neat? He gets it. If you take seriously what I have come to serve as a servant beneath you in my mind, and if you take to heart this and you grow and mature in this, you're about to go on to do things which he knows is understood and recognized as a part of the whole body. What if you looked at everybody on the screen right now at River Shabbat and truly realized that they're all playing a part of your Bema seat? <laughs> How are you going to treat them? I know. We'll, go, we'll get back to grumbling and disputing. That's what Paul says. Look at the rest of your brothers and sisters and grumble and dispute so you can have a really excellent judgment seat from Messiah. <laughs> Is that what it says?
man, Paul just understood things. Like he's so awesome the way he just speaks to people. And it is actually very plain if we know what we're looking at. It's just awesome how he speaks and addresses. He's, you know, he, he really is gifted. That's what I'm going to say to him. When I see Paul, I'm going to say, Paul, you, you seriously were one gifted dude and you actually operated with it and submitted it to Messiah. And I personally am very thankful for that. The, the, the gift that this man had to relay truth was stunning. And if he hadn't been obedient to serve our Messiah to do that, you know, this is incredible stuff. Look at this. So he's, he's going back to Torah and he's giving us now, you guys have got to live this out in the spiritual sense, even the libation of the, of the, of the drink offerings relating to the, uh, the Levitical sacrifices. Look at this. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in Master Yeshua to send Timothy. Now he's going to make it a body thing. Isn't this interesting? Who's he trusting regarding Timothy? Messiah. Who's he, rec- who's he saying that Timothy was sent by? Messiah. That's the esteem he's giving Timothy. Whoa. I thought Paul was the fancy Mr. Know-it-all, quote the book of Deuteronomy, Pharisee of Pharisees, da 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 And what's he saying about young Timothy? I recognize that Yeshua sent him. Wow. This man had all, I mean, honestly, Timothy would have sat there and been in awe of Paul's knowledge, just so we know. In awe. He wouldn't have held a candlestick to the wielding of knowledge and information of the Torah and the prophets to Paul. Yet that man that Timothy wouldn't even be able to remotely win an argument with, that man says, but I trust Master Yeshua to send Timothy. Not him. (laughs) Notice who he's giving glory to. To you shortly, so that I too encourage by the news from you. So in other words, I recognize that he's Timothy's from Yeshua, and he's sending him to you. This is good for you. Young Timothy, look at this. For I have no one else of the same mind who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. What was he seeing in Timothy? A true love for what Yeshua loved. See, this is what he's identifying. He wasn't sitting there in awe of Timothy's knowledge or how Timothy won arguments on, you know, how to pronounce the name of the father or something like that. He's literally looking at him and going, this has the love of Messiah in him. Now, that doesn't mean Timothy wasn't knowledgeable, okay? And, you know, and and didn't understand certain things. But he is glorifying Messiah here in all ways, using Timothy to do that. For all seek their own interests, not those of Messiah. In other words, he's saying, most of the people I hang with, they're all doing it for themselves. Not Timothy. I'm seeing something different. But you know, he has proven himself. Wait a minute. You mean Timothy was tested? He was observed? He was discerned by Paul? Wow. I'm going to suggest to you that trust is not earned and it is not just given. True trust is learned. And you need to discern. You need to have that understanding, that maturity, everything else. And I'll tell you what, do you think Paul had the maturity to discern Timothy? Does anybody here think that Paul was capable of discerning whether Timothy was truly of Messiah or not? Hands up. Absolutely. And then he gives glory to Messiah. Doesn't even take it for himself. Look at this. But you know he has proven himself that the son with his father, he served with me for the good news or the gospel, the coming of Messiah. Messiah has come. I trust in the master that I myself should also come shortly. So Paul's in eager expectation at this point from house arrest going, I trust he's going to send me back to you. It's a good, it's a good thing. And this is where Paul's sitting. It's a hope of his, it's a joy. 
And if you're in house arrest or prison, that would be a joyful thought, wouldn't it? A hopeful expectation to be able to get back to those whom you love, to fellowship with. I indeed right now, as we're under house arrest where I am, I have a hope that I, I'll be able to reunite with those whom I love in fellowship. But we're under house arrest right now. I can't do it until that changes. Only Messiah can change that right now. I got to rely on it. Doesn't mean I don't have a hopeful expectation or a joy to thinking about that reuniting. But you know, he's proven himself, son of the father, he's served with me for the good news. So I expect to send him as soon as I see how it goes with me. So he's telling them, I got stuff going on here. In fact, I find myself actually speaking like that these days. Not that I'm comparing myself to Paul. I'm not, there's, there's not even a, a playing field that remotely, uh, where I could step anywhere near the field of, of what this man is. But I get a sense of what he's talking about there. And I trust in master that I myself should also come short. But I thought it necessary. Look at this. <laughs> so this is where it gets in. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your emissary and servant to my need. So I can get him there. He says, since he was longing for you all and being troubled because you had heard that he was sick. So now they're getting news right, that this servant is sick. Now, uh, Epaphrodite um, just shows up in all of this, in this reference. So wait a minute, he's talking about Timothy. Now he's talking about another servant who he's discerned and whatnot. And he's speaking to them because he is known to the early Kahal in Philippi. He says, for indeed he was sick. Look at this, near to death. But Elohim had compassion on him, and not only on him, but on me as well lest I should have sadness upon sadness. Therefore, I sent him more eagerly, so he's recovered, so that you are seeing him again, that you might rejoice, and I be less sad. Isn't that interesting? Epaphroditus getting there has given a joy to Paul, even though Paul couldn't be the one to go. Isn't that awesome? He's enjoying them being together. Because he knows that there is the true love of Messiah occurring. And so he's experiencing joy through Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Okay, so uh, where are we? Therefore, uh, sorry, receive him therefore in the master with all joy and hold such as he is in esteem. Because of the work of the master, he was near death, risking his life to fill up what was lacking in your service towards me. So he's come to learn, to grow, to mature. Now he's coming back and he almost paid his life for it. And now there's going to be a great joy. Do you know what Paul's doing? He's sending back a great gift to them because they had been a part of that by sending him to Paul. And so there's this beautiful thing going on. And so they're all going to grow and benefit from it. Paul's just saying, I don't get to enjoying it yet, but I will have joy knowing that it's happening. Does that make sense? So how do we view now this place? Because we're at this fear and trembling bit. So before he talks about how the body's going to interact, it's going to love, he's going to experience joy, people are going to grow, they're going to mature, they're going to be in a place where they're, uh, um, it's going to be pleasing to the Father. He prefaces this with how we are to view in order to get there. It is fear and trembling and working out your salvation as a part of that. So let's take that seriously. So while Paul was in prison in Rome with the call of Philippi, he sent uh, uh, Epaphroditus to minister to him. In return, Paul sent Timothy to the congregation of Philippi. So he got all of this beautiful thing going on. There's also a slave here that comes into the picture. We're going to speak about a bit more about this in chapter four. Uh, Inos uh, Onisamus, uh, or Inosimus. And he became a believer in Messiah. Now, this is an interesting thing. He was sent this letter and he returned to him and his master. So this other uh, bond servant shows up in all of this. And this is written about in the book of uh, Philemon. And he's writing to his brother, Philemon. And this was Philemon's bond servant slave. And what Paul is saying to him now as this is occurring. So he's in house arrest. He's speaking to his brother and his brother sends his bond servant. 
And so we, now we have uh, uh, Inosimus, and he's come. And after he spends time with Inosimus, he basically writes to his brother, Philemon. In the book of Philemon, you'll read this. And he says, as a fellow believer, would you please, Philemon, treat him as you treat me? And basically what he's saying is, release him to his next level of freedom. Treat him, receive him. How would he have been expected to be received? How would Paul be expected to be received? As a fellow brother. This is interesting. So there's something that's coming up with his servitude, and he's saying we're going to learn now how this is actually going to look. Brother to brother, sister to sister. It's Messiah in us. Um, and in fact, it's tradition, but it records, at least um, from a traditional aspect, that apparently this bond servant actually became a servant leader in the early Kahal as a result. And this is how the, the Kahal just continued to spread and to grow. And indeed, we're all here today. But what actually allowed that was getting back to serving one another, was getting back to understanding what a servant looks like, what a bond servant truly looks like, which we did in chapter one. Okay. It says here in, uh, in Philemon, 115, uh, in Philemon uh, 115, 17. So it says, for this perhaps is why he parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. So he's speaking to his brother, spiritual brother. And he's speaking to him and he's saying to him that you may have him back for he's come, but now you may have him back forever. That has overtones of eternal talk to it, doesn't it? So he's speaking to him in the, in the shadow pictures, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the master, Yeshua. So now treat him. He's come. He's done this thing. Now receive him now in a different way. And he's encouraging his brother, please do this, because it's going to grow and benefit the kingdom. Like, do you see what's happening? He's, he's instructing him how to view him now. And it's interesting. He's progressed. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. So he's not put himself above. You know, so, uh, uh, only some. He's not put himself above that. He's saying we're equal in that sense, in walking in humility and as, and as the true meaning of bond servant in brotherly love. And, uh, and so you've got this whole um, understanding of uh, um, the different components, in, especially in Greek thinking, where love, we get the word love translated in English, right? But, you know, you have agape, but brotherly love is phileo. And it's so this ability to work with one another and Messiah in them. And the, and the kingdom, what turned human history at this point? did not occur without the understanding of what Paul's talking about and what he was given to deliver. This is often missed. All of human history was changed because there was an allowance for the bond servant to grow in Messiah, to humble each other, to walk in humility that the God, that the good news of Messiah could not be stopped. In other words, the Nicolaitan system was brought, was busted to bits. I'm going to break this. That's what Messiah was essentially doing. That's why he said, I tell you the truth. This thing's coming down and I'm raising up three days. They killed him for it. He knew they would. But he was coming against the system, not against the truth or his father's ways. Just a corrupt system. Look at this. Romans 14, 8, 10. For we live as we live to the master. If we die, we die to the master. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the masters. So Paul's going, come on. All right. This is the understanding of justification, redemption in that sense at its base level. Then he goes on to say this, for this end, Messiah died and lived again. Justification, his blood, that he might be master of both the dead and the living. That is direct re reference to guess what? What appointed time is he referencing right, right then and there? And if you know the speak of the Moedim, they can write through the word. You'll now see it all over the place. Yom Teruah. What? First, the dead in Messiah will rise, and then those who are alive will be cut. Oh, let me see. He's speaking appointed times right in front of us, if we can see it. He might be the master of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Now he's going, now, what's going to occur when we're resurrected on Yom Teruah? The Bema seed of Messiah. He goes straight to, why do you pass judgment on your brother? 
Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Elohim. So just in case you don't know that this is Yom Teruah. And, and, and does Paul know what's going to occur once the dead and the living and Messiah are raised? You better believe it. It's called the judgment seat of Messiah. Paul got this absolutely, literally, and spiritually in the weightier matters. And he basically what he's saying is, understand that this is a judgment that's going to lead to a judgment, a Bema seat. Paul speaks to this all through it, but he's speaking to it to the fall appointed times and their fulfillment. Then look where it goes. In Romans 14, 11, 12, it goes on to say this. Lord is written, as I live, says Yah, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to Elohim. So then each of us will give an account to himself, to Elohim, of himself to Elohim. Whoa. You mean you're not bringing anyone else with you? You don't get to bring such and such? You don't get to bring the devil? Does that say? And so each of us will give an account and have the devil there to blame as we do in front of Elohim. This is what it's saying. This is what they knew and they understood. Again, we're speaking about Yom Teruah or Feast of Trumpets or the appointed time of trumpets. Look at this. In Isaiah 45, 22, 25, there's a very interesting thing. This relates because they are quoting or understanding something from what was the word at that time. And what was the word at that time? The Torah and the prophets. Again, we're able to read this now in the, in the testimony from the Brit Hadashah of what was always there. Look what it says here. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. What do you mean? You mean the house of Israel is going to get scattered to the four corners of the earth? Oh, that's right. Yep. <laughs> By myself, I have sworn. Why? I've got, I've got it in the title there because there's nothing higher. That's good news for us. You can't go any higher than this. He has to swear on himself because there's nowhere else to go. This is it. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. Look at this. To me, every knee. To me, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. The word confess being used there, sava in the Hebrew, to swear, adjourn, take an oath. Wait a minute. That's interesting. This isn't the Catholic confession box with the priest, with all your bad behavior in the flesh. Isn't that what you thought it was? You pray every day. Father, I did this. I did that. I did. Imagine how boring that would get as, a, as you know, he's inserted you in the time domain. You're in a fallen state and all you're telling him is your bad behavior. Of course, doesn't mean that he likes our bad behavior. Can you imagine if that was the only relationship you had with your children, parents? They came to you once a day and said, I have done this, I have done that, I've done this, da 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 da, da. please forgive me. It would drive you nuts. You'd sit there and go, I know what you did. We, you know, let, let's move on from this place. Let's grow, let's mature, <laughs> okay? But what did Catholicism do? Oh yeah, get in the box. And admit all your bad behavior. And again, I say, I'm just not saying the bad behavior is, is a good thing and that it's acceptable and that's what the father wants. What I'm saying is let's be very careful what this is actually saying. Sava in the Hebrew is to adjourn, is to take an oath. It's to do something here. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath to him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is starting to change things, isn't it? It's not the Catholic model. What's happening here? Only in Yah, it shall be said of me, are righteous and strength. Only in him. Okay, wait a minute. That's direct pointing to who? If our righteousness is by the blood of Messiah, who's that talking about? Yeshua. You're seeing it right there. To him shall come and be ashamed all that were incensed against him. Oh, were they incensed against Yeshua? <laughs> Did they kill him? Isn't it amazing? You're just going to find your Messiah right through all of this. In Yah... All the offspring of Israel shall be justified. Why? Because his blood justifies us, not ours, his. And he will raise us to a glorified state. But there's something in between. It's called sanctification. And this is what Paul was literally delivering at absolute levels that are staggering. 
for our purpose and for changing the course of human history. The coming cosmic messiah. And some of you might have seen my, my thing on the uh, dis messiah deception and everything else. I want to point out something here. Okay, and if you haven't seen that, we don't have time to get into really what this does, but I do a whole series on the Messiah deception. But what I can tell you is the image you're seeing there, okay, is the most popular image on earth. There is no single image that is more popular than that image. That image is found nowhere in scripture, yet it is attributed to our Messiah. How was something like this propagated to such a level that I can take this to any color culture in any corner of the earth. And they will tell you that is Jesus of the Bible. That should be disturbing to all of us because I'd suggest to you, the God of the world of this world did not orchestrate that because he doesn't plan to use it or at least the possibility of it. Okay. The scripture does warn us of some things. In Matthew 24, 23, uh, 24, is Tommy Dean are asking him, okay, okay, so what's going to go on you know, just before your return? They're coming because that's what they're interested in because they, he knows that you know, their master's just pissed off everybody in the Sanhedrin and they're all toast now because of his, his behavior. They're freaking out. All right, so what are we you know, we're going to look for? You? And we need to understand this. And so in this briefing, he goes on to say this. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah or there, do not believe it. Now, these are the signs. Now, that's interesting because if we had internet and television, that's very possible, isn't it? Look, something's come. Look here. Look at, he's saying, I believe what you're seeing is a built-in statement of technology. It could last over 2,000 years because he's not going to be talking about TVs and internet and computers. But he is saying, if they tell you this, why would he say that? They will need to say this. Because there's a distinction that he's going to make. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, i.e. the chosen. So we've got kind of a bridal language coming in here. We see that this is backed up in the Gospel of Mark. It says in 23 here, for false messiahs and false prophets shall rise, show signs and wonders. Look at this. But Mark throws in there to seduce. You have a language of mystery Babylon going on. Seduction. Of course, we're warned about spiritual adultery. If it were possible, even the elect, the chosen. Now, the example that's being made there, it's interesting. Apparently, the chosen, it's not possible. Now, aka, who chooses a bride for the son? The father. This is a chosen position. I'd suggest to you the reason why it's not possible, and the only reason why, is because his bride actually knows her groom. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, she won't be fooled. Because she actually grew and matured to enough intimacy that this does not add up. Whatever I'm seeing, that's not it. Do you see my point? If, if, a, if a bride got to know her bridegroom, she's not going to be fooled if something else shows up claiming to be the bridegroom. Do you see the point? I know that that's not him. Now, apparently, there are going to be believers that do not know that according to scripture. And we're going to see this spectrum right across the religious spectrum. I've got atheism and humanism, okay, it's panspermia evolution. So for the atheists, it's going to be, oh, okay, well, this is the galactic, this is the aliens. For Islam, well, it's Jesus, the great prophet. For Christianity, it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. For Judaism, it's the first coming of Messiah, Messianic Hebrew roots. Well, we'll go along with whatever Judas says. <laughs> you know, Hinduism, one of many. Yep, that's fine. That works for us. Buddhism, peace on earth. Yes, this is a master. New age movements and cults. This is the ascended master. Fence sitters and agnostic. Well, I guess this makes sense. I can see why. <laughs> you see, there, there isn't anyone that this image could not fulfill if it is done a certain way. Do you see the point I'm making? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't know whether this image will be brought to life to that level. It does talk about the image coming to life. It does seem to indicate certain technologies will be used because it's not omnipresent. But somehow a world is going to need a false Messiah, a hero. We're going to be told about it and Messiah is going, don't believe it. It's not me. And apparently there's going to be a bride of Messiah that will not be fooled by this. 
but there's going to be many religious people and non-religious that are. Now, I'm saying I wouldn't put it past him. I'm not saying this is what it's going to be. But there seems to be a lot of effort to make the most famous image on earth completely the opposite of what you read in scripture. And it happens to be known by everything you're seeing on that screen right now and revered. So just put it this way. I wouldn't be surprised if galactic Messiah does look like a long haired, blue eyed hippie. Okay. Just, I'm just stating that I wouldn't be surprised. And that it certainly is of extraterrestrial origins, not interdimensional, extraterrestrial. The Bible speaks dimensionally, not extraterrestrially. Big difference. We know this for sure, though. Our real Messiah, King and Groom, will be the last to arrive with great strength and power. This we know for sure. And in Matthew 27, just of it, Messiah makes this point. If you need the internet, if you need TV, if you need all of this to be told that he's here, I'm here now, it's not me. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, in other words, the earth, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, I don't need technology for my arrival. Guess what a point in time that's talking about? <laughs> You're looking at Yom Kippur and the fulfillment of it. It's over. He's here. And every knee will bow at this point, literally. What is ever there physically? He, Yeshua goes on directly after saying, don't be deceived. He's making the point now. You will not need a thing to know I've come. Do you see my point? So if, if, if you are having to take CNN to show you the live landing of galactic Jesus, <laughs> You know, if you, if you believe everything CNN is saying now, don't believe it then. And by the way, Fox will be showing Galactic Jesus too. So for all you Fox watchers, don't worry, they're going to be showing them as well. That's basically, I believe, what he's saying. Now, will it actually play out to that level of deception, which would be a great one? It's possible. It's interesting when it says here in Philippians, I'm now going to go to the 2.12. Work out with fear and trembling. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now. Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Now it says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The word work out there in the English, okay, the katergazomai, uh, it means to perform, accomplish, achieve, finish, to bring about, to fashion. Interesting. In my presence, much more in my absence. Look at this. Accomplish. To perform, achieve, to finish. So you mean salvation is more than just justification? It's more than just glorification? There's sanctification? And this is what Paul would do. He would break an understanding of the process of redemption. And he's saying, your Messiah has got you by both hands here. Don't worry. He'll resurrect you on Yom Teruah. Don't worry. His blood has been spilled for you, but we got some stuff to work out here in the middle. That's why I'm here. That's why Timothy's here. That's why Epaphrodus is here. You see, that's what he's saying. We're here for the sanctifying side. Oh, by the way, his bride was the one who made herself ready. Paul has come for the purpose of bridal preparation, the servitude of a bridegroom that's saying, go, that she may prepare herself. Religion is just quite happy with, I'm saved, you resurrect me and give me a whole bunch of good stuff. You know, and I don't know why I was put here in the first place. The salvation, the word being there, the, the sotaria or in the Greek, okay, deliverance, preservation, safety. So finish this thing, accomplish this thing for your deliverance. Look at this. Now do it with fear, phobos. This is interesting. Phobos. Fear, dread, it can mean that, but look what else it means in the Greek. Reverence for one's husband. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Let me just read that now. I want you to finish something, maybe garment preparation. I want you to do this for the purpose of your well-being and deliverance. And I want you to do this with the reverence as one has for her husband. Why? Because it's going to allow you, look at this, <laughs> trembling, the tromos. 
even in entomology, they're leading, leading to trauma. Look at this. The anxiety of one who distrusts the ability to completely meet all requirements. In other words, you know you can't do this on your own. You need a helper. And that, of course, is in the ancient Hebrew wedding model. The best friend of the groom would go and work with the bride and teach her all about who her bridegroom was. So she would recognize, know who he was in all ways. This is really interesting. But does his utmost to fulfill his duty, which is exactly what Paul's saying. So let's get this straight now. I need you to accomplish, finish, right? Do this. I want you to finish this for the purpose of your own safety deliverance in this process. And I want you to do this with the love of a bride for her husband. Because you know you're not worthy in and of yourself. So finish the race. Does that take on new meaning as to what we're looking at with fear and trembling? No. It's interesting, isn't it? And we get all these connotations in our religious worlds and realities. And if we actually know what we're reading here, this brings a whole new thing to it. It's interesting what we see here in Nehemiah 9.6. And this is this whole point of you've got people coming back. And in this case, what was leading up to this, it was the prophet Ezra, the scribe Ezra. He's going through the Torah and they're celebrating Sukkot, the wedding feast. This is really interesting. Okay. And they get to the last day or the 24th of the month. And they, they, they all get to a point on Shemini Yatzeret of confessing they're missing the mark. And this is what they do. This is how they understand fear and trembling. They get back to this point and they say, you are, you are, you alone, you made the heavens. They're now going to acknowledge their Elohim at this level. You're going to see now how a national teshuva looks like or how or what it could look like. And hopefully we will too. The heavens of the heavens with all their hosts and the earth and all that is on it and the seas and all that is in them. And you will preserve all of them. The host of heaven worships you. Wow. What's the word there? Sava. To bow down, to prostrate oneself. Okay, remember, every knee shall bow. Remember what's going to be raised up on Yom Teruah? Those who are alive, those who are dead. Wait a minute. But this, this, this reference to something is including what? The heavenly host? It's including those on the earth. Remember, the dead and the sea are going to be raised. Well, what's going on here? And you're going to preserve them all? How's, what's happening here? How big is this? And what is going on? But this is what this, the declaration they are making after coming to a place of teshuva. It goes on later in Nehemiah 38 because it's a lot that goes on there. There's so much stuff being made. But they get to this point and they say, because of all of this. So they're listing everything out. Go, go and read it, Nehemiah, in there. It's very interesting. We make a firm covenant in writing, and they're going to seal it now. So they're now giving back to their Elohim in the language that he spoke to them. Okay? He says, are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. They're going to start to do this. By the way, they are referencing now both the government of a nation and the temple administration of a nation. It is a national act of teshuva and repentance occurring here. And they are willing to make the firm covenant on this and seal it. This is how much they're in repentance. Look at this. goes on in Nehemiah 10, 28, 29. Look at the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, the se separate, the, all those who had separated themselves from the people, the lands, and the, uh, to the law of Elohim, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who acknowledge and understanding. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and then enter into the curse or the oath to walk in Elohim's law that was given by Moshe, the servant of Elohim. Now they've gone directly now to the Torah and the covenant. Isn't this interesting? There's nothing they left out. Families, governance, temple service, everything. It's all in here. And to observe and do all the commandments of Yah Elohim, his rules and his statutes. Do you know what they're doing? They are completely in Teshuva now. And guess what it's going to be? Everybody we associate ourselves with that would call themselves, um, uh, everybody that would call themselves as a part of the house of Israel. Nothing is left untouched. We will not continue and we will not bring in, and if you know where Nehemiah goes with this, it actually goes into a place where, and we will not bring in those who are unequally yoked as a part of this whole promise. 
And this gets into being equally yoked and all those kind of things. And many of us in our lives, um, many of you here came into the faith and you might have been in a marriage and suddenly you found yourself in an unequally yoked situation. That's very difficult to find oneself in. It really is. And for those of you that have had a chance to do it together, you should really appreciate and thank your Elohim for it. it's a beautiful thing. Some of you came into the faith and then found someone else who was. And now you enter into the covenant shadow picture together in marriage, equally yoked. And that's what it's meaning. Look at this. Isaiah 33, 21, 22. But there, Yah and majesty will be for us a place. Look at this, of broad rivers and streams. Living waters, where no, no, uh, where no galley with oars can go and no majestic ships can pass. Look at this. For Yah is our judge. What was all judgment given to? We know scripture. All judgment is given to who? You're seeing a statement of deity here, by the way, of Yeshua, if you know what you're reading. For Yah is our judge. This is, what they, this is how they declared it. Yah is our lawgiver. Yah is our king. Who's king? Who's identified as king? Oh, Yeshua. He will save us. Oh, Yehoshua, Elohim, saves us. You starting to see this? Every ounce of this is pointing to Yeshua, your Messiah. It was in the Torah. It was in the prophets. And it was testified in what you call the New Testament. It's all there. We don't have to make this up. Isaiah 60, 14. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. Woe. And all who despise you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of Yah, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. What does he call his people? Israel. Do you know what the word Zion means in the Hebrew meaning or can mean? Mountain. In other words, it's a term for government. Oh, wait a minute. Is there going to be something that rules and reigns with Messiah for a thousand years? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's read that again. All who despised you, they're going to be bad law. They're going to come down and bow at your feet. They shall call you the city of Yah. You see in Revelation with this beautiful picture of his bride, he's described as the city. The government of the Holy One of Israel. Who's the Holy One of Israel? Anybody take a guess? <laughs> the government of Yeshua. What's going to go forth from Jerusalem? His ways, his laws. How's it going to go forth according to scripture? There's going to be a governance, a bridal governance. Something he can trust. In Isaiah 60, 66, 22, 23. For all, for as the new heavens and the new earth, or renewed or refreshed, that I um, that I make shall remain before me, says Yah. So shall your offspring and your name remain. Look at this: from new moon to moon, new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship me uh, before me, declares Yah. The word there again is to bow down. You mean every knee is literally going to bow? Not, not just the bride who got this going in and who received a reward judgment and was selected and chosen by the Father to rule and reign. Everyone is going to do this. There will be no one. When it, say, when it says every knee shall bow, when Paul is declaring this in Philippians, he means it. From the heavenly hosts to that which has gone into the chains of Tartarus to anyone who has ever lived. The bride just seems to figure this out first. <laughs> she was the one who got it. But that doesn't mean everyone else again. Guess what? Bill Gates will bow down before Yeshua before this is over. Just so you know. So will Biden. So will Justin Trudeau. That fills me with joy, that thought. Maybe for the wrong reasons, but nonetheless, it fills me with joy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm going to have to be real honest there. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, I can't wait to see Biden bow down before Yeshua. I'm sorry, but I'm just, I can't wait for it. 
That's going to be a glorious day. And Trudeau. I'd like to see those two bow down together, actually. But apparently that's not going to happen. They're going to have to give account for themselves. Anyway, Isaiah 66, 22, 23. Um, very, very important that you, what you're seeing there is literal. Bow down prostate. Look at this. Matthew 4, 9. Somebody else tried to avoid all of this, to supersede it, to usurp the whole process. You remember when she was taken into the wilderness, taken into the wilderness and he's, he's without the food and the water and everything else? Who came when it's time of weakness in the flesh to try and tempt him with something? This would be the adversary. And he's about to try and surp, just basically usurp this whole process, this declaration that was in the Torah and the prophets. There's something interesting going on because he says here, he took him to a very high mountain. Who took him there? The adversary did. Wait a minute. So the adversary is in a place of God of this world and Yeshua is in the place of the flesh. It's very, very interesting what's going on here. And he showed him the kingdoms of the world. Wait a minute. The adversary is showing the kingdoms of the world to Yeshua because Yeshua is not cheating. He's actually in the flesh, and he's in a body that is thirsty, that is getting hungry, and can die. There's no cheating here. Hasatan's trying to take advantage of something, but look what he tries to do it with. All he's asking for. And he said to him, all these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. That it, by the way, the word worship there is not what I'm going to focus on. Here's the Greek equivalent of the savak. But look at this, fall down, the pipto in Greek, to descend from a higher place to lower, to fall, to be thrust down. Uh-oh. Who's going to be cast down, according to scripture in the end? We're going to see Hasatan and all those who are, they're going to be cast to the earth, right? This was a willing choice for Elohim to insert himself. And what Hasatan is doing here, and it is missed, if you will do this, of your own free will. In other words, bow down to me. Sava me. I'll call it off. They're all, they're all going to be fine. You can have them all. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world because it's his right at this point. But you, you bow to me. And you can save them all. Just do it my way. And my way says, you worship me. And look at the answer of Yeshua. This is incredible what's actually going on here. He's trying to superintend the whole thing. Don't worry. I know you're trying to redeem them all. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what's going on here, but I'll tell you what. If, if you just do this, I'll tell them all the truth and they'll all know you're da 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 da, -da. But just bow to me. Fall down, come from your higher place and put yourself beneath me. Because in no way, shape or form, just because Elohim took on the flesh, just because he didn't cheat, in no way, shape or form was he lowering himself below Hasatan. And this is your proof of it. Hasatan's requesting it. This is interesting. This is Yeshua's response. Be gone, adversary, for it is written, you shall worship Yah, your Elohim, and only him shall you serve. He's making that first point, first person, and covering all. Guess what? You're subject to this too. And I'm reminding you. And he's doing it from a position of thirsting, hungering, and is going to face death. In that position, he was not going to give up the kingdom. And it is an incredible thing here. Did Hasatan have the ability to call it off? Did he have the ability as a servant to go, okay? Yeah. He's trying to serve it. In fact, I'll go as far as to say, I think he's trying to save his own butt. Not just, <laughs> you know, I think there's something going on here. There's a lot of self going on here by the adversary. A lot of self in its fullest of pride in every way, shape, or form. And we miss it. Every knee shall bow to Yah. That's how it works. No other way. 
In Revelation 3, 8, 9, it's incredible. We see this, of course, in the place where we all think everybody's the Church of Philadelphia, right? Everybody's the Cajal of Philadelphia, <laughs> you know, because they, they got nothing bad said about them. Listen to this. I know your works. I know your deeds. Behold, I set before you an open door. Now, if we know the wedding model, right? The bride shows up at the door and knocks. He brings her in. They have their meal together. The dowry, you know, it's all explained. The covenant's agreed to. They have the cup of wine together, all this kind of thing. Listen to that bridal language. There's an open door before you. It's open. See, the one knocking is the Cajal next, which is Laodicea. <laughs> <laughs> these ones are in such good esteem the, bride, the groom's got the door open this is really interesting game totally missed it's all bridal language it's all ancient hebrew marriage covenant language which no one is able to shut no one why because yeshua didn't bow down to the god of this world he's preserving this all now for what it was all about in fact, he's going to flip the tables on this, and you'll see this in a second. I know that you have but little power, but yet you have kept my word and did not deny my name. Behold, look at this. I will make those of the synagogue of the adversary who say they are Yehudi, Jews, and who are not, but lie. Behold, look at this. Those that have even hijacked the tribe of Yehuda, those who claim to be Jews and were not, I'm going to make them come down and bow down before your feet. And they will learn that I have loved you. You mean the ones that had little power, the ones that were regarded as second-class citizens, the ones that were treated as the ones that didn't know or understand anything, and the ones who claimed to be the know-it-alls, they're going to bow before her. It's a statement of bride. He's just told you, the Church of, of Philadelphia here, the Hall of Philadelphia, you're the bride. It's an open door. No one can shut this. It's a beautiful statement. In Ephesians, we're going to finish here. The why. Paul talks about the why of it all. The why we bow. This is what he says. In Ephesians, this credible book that we call Ephesians, which was written to the whole body. And in 1470, in chapter 3, it says this. For this reason, I bow my knees. Now, this Paul's about to tell you. I'm going to tell you why I bow. Not that I will. He knows he will. But I'm going to tell you why. He's actually understood why he's doing it. For whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, that's Messiah, he may grant you be strengthened with power through the Ruach, through his spirit in your inner being. Now, remember, we get back to how he's saying and how he's working with the servants, with Timothy. With that, uh, uh, Epiphr uh, uh, Titus. The, how he's working this. This is, this is how it's going to go forth. Now think about what he's saying here. This is why I'm going to bow. Through the Ruach in your inner being, so that Messiah may dwell in your hearts, which is the true temple, so that this is going to happen, so that the faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, in other words, he talks about after this, and he goes on, that you may grow to the fullness of Messiah, because it is only Messiah that is going to change the course of all human history. And Paul is saying, you know why I bow to that Messiah? Because he's the only one who can do it. And if I don't bow to him, if I don't serve him, if I don't do this the way he says, then this isn't going to happen. You're not going to be rooted and grounded in love. And your heart will not be the dwelling place of Elohim. It will not receive the circumcision. Again, the penis is easy. The heart is tough. Paul knew why he was kneeling, because it is the righteous king, and his plan of redemption is what this is about. Paul knew that that submission was because of a great plan of redemption that was completely rooted in love, and this was a king worthy to bow to. It wasn't going to be a Hasatan and try and cheat the whole thing. No cheating here. No sidestepping, no usurping. I bow to this because I know everything I am seeing is love. It's not how we were taught fear and trembling, is it? We talked about the fear and trembling. No. He is bowing because he knows what he is seeing is love at a depth 
and a dimension and in a way that he has never known. And he's trying to relay this now to the people. Look at this. Goes on to say that they may have strength to comprehend. And now he talks about the dimensional states of the creation of Elohim with all the saints. What is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth? It will take all those four dimensions to know the fifth. That we may know the love of Messiah that surpasses knowledge. Love surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled, look at this, with the fullness of Elohim. Is it possible that this interdimensional talk, it requires the first four in this fallen state with our own sovereign choice to bow a knee in the way that we were supposed to understand that this act of experiencing being trapped in the time domain, understanding that there are dimensions to this, that the fifth dimension of love can only be understood if we have experienced this. Unconditional love, which Adam and Eve did not have before the fall, and neither did the heavenly host. And we're going to talk about this in a big way when we come to talk about and, and share with you things on the great white throne judgment and how big this all really is, where it will all end. We can't go beyond that. That's where the wall is. We can only take this as far as the great white throne judgment, and we're going to do that. The interdimensional realms, we have all been given choices within the time domain, and they're all for the purposes of love, and it does involve us. There is something big going down here. And next week, we're going to take a glimpse into the heavenly passport because this is where Paul Count goes to. If we understand this, thy kingdom come. And he talks about the citizenship of what this means, what we've been called to, what we've been invited to. But he's doing it on the basis of bondservant, on the basis of understanding what bowing a knee is, on the basis of why we bow that knee and what this really means. And we don't want to religiousize all this and we want to know what it's actually saying and what he was conveying. Amen? Okay, let's finish there. So uh, let's, let's take a break. Go grab your coffee, go to the restroom, go to the washroom, uh, and we'll come back and we'll have a little bit of Q&A. <laughs>